In today's lesson, we're going to talk about three macroeconomic objectives. We're going to define each of these three objectives and show how a country can determine whether or not it is meeting these economic objectives. Additionally, we're going to look at a production possibilities curve model, which is one of the most basic models of a nation's macroeconomy, and illustrate how the three macroeconomic objectives can be shown on a simple PPC diagram showing the trade-off that a nation faces between the production of capital goods and consumer goods. So there are three main macroeconomic objectives that macroeconomic policy makers are always aiming to achieve. These are economic growth, low unemployment, and low and stable inflation. So let's begin with definitions of these three macroeconomic goals before we show how they can be calculated and illustrated on a production possibilities diagram. Let's begin with economic growth. Economic growth has a very simple definition. It is simply an increase in the output of goods and services in a nation over time. Now how do we know if economic growth is being achieved? We must have some sort of calculation that we can do to determine whether or not growth has occurred. And there is in fact a very simple formula to calculate the economic growth rate of a nation. What we need is two years in which we can measure the GDP between one year and the next. To calculate the growth rate in a nation, all we need to do is take the GDP of year two, subtract the GDP of year one, and divide it by the GDP of year one. Let's use an example here. Let's assume that in 2009, Switzerland's GDP equaled $400 billion. But in 2010, Switzerland's GDP equaled $408 billion. Clearly, there was economic growth between 2009 and 2010. To determine the growth rate, we'll call it GR, all we must do is find the percentage change in GDP between these two years. So to do that, we can take the new GDP of 408, subtract the original GDP of 400, and divided by the base year GDP, which was 2009, which is 400. This gives us a GDP growth rate of 8 divided by 400, and if we multiply that by 100, we will get a percentage. Here we can see that Switzerland's GDP grew by approximately 2% between 2009 and 2010. This tells us that Switzerland was meeting its first macroeconomic objective of economic growth. If we were to look at a production possibilities curve for Switzerland between 2009 and 2010, we should be able to illustrate the econo economic growth that the country experienced. The PPC is a simple model showing the total output of two goods that a country is able to achieve using its land, labor, and capital resources at any given particular period of time. So we're going to start with the production possibilities curve. The black PPC here will represent the PPC for 2009. Now what happens between 2009 and 2010? Switzerland's GDP increased, implying that the nation was able to produce more output of goods and services. This can be shown as an outward shift of Switzerland's production possibilities. Economic growth can be shown on the PPC diagram by shifting a nation's production possibilities curve outwards. So in 2010, due to the increase in output of goods and services that occurred, Switzerland's production possibilities curve shifted to the right to the red dashed line. This is how we illustrate economic growth on a production possibilities model. We can see that if we were to put two points, one we'll call point A and one we'll call point B, between the years 2009 and 2010, Switzerland underwent economic growth which enabled it to produce more consumer goods while simultaneously producing more capital goods. This is clearly beneficial for Switzerland which helps explain why economic growth is one of the three primary macroeconomic objectives of a nation. Now let's move on to our second macroeconomic objective. We must define unemployment. Before we can determine why unemployment is a worthy macroeconomic objective and before we can determine how we calculate the nation's unemployment rate. Unemployment is defined simply as the state of an individual who is out of work and unable 
to find a job. One key characteristic of unemployment is that in order to be considered unemployed, an individual must be actively seeking employment. Now, unemployment is clearly undesirable. The state of being out of work and not being able to find a job implies that large numbers of people in the economy are suffering. They are not earning an income. They are therefore dependent on somebody else for their support, either family members or the state in the form of unemployment benefits or welfare payments from the government. Unemployment, therefore, is not desired in a nation, and low unemployment is a worthy macroeconomic goal. But how can unemployment be calculated? In order to find the level of unemployment in a country, governments measure what is called the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate, which we will abbreviate UR, measures the number of unemployed people as a proportion of the total labor force. Very simple calculation. It's the number of people who are unable to find work but actively seeking work divided by the total labor force. Let's define total labor force now. This is an important component of our calculation of the unemployment rate. Therefore, we need a clear definition. The total labor force refers to the working age population of a country which is either employed or unemployed. Somebody who is an adult but is not part of the labor force might be someone who is in university studying and therefore not actively seeking jobs or employed in a job. Another example of, of an adult who may not be part of the labor force is somebody who is imprisoned or somebody who is in an institution or hospitalized for some reason. Only adults who are actively seeking work or are actually employed are considered part of the labor force. And to find the unemployment rate, we simply divide the number of unemployed people by the number of people in the labor force, which basically includes the unemployed plus the employed. Let's do a simple calculation for Switzerland again. Let's assume that in 2010, Switzerland had 150,000 unemployed people. And let's assume that the total labor force of Switzerland is approximately 5 million people. Now, to find the unemployment rate, all we must do is find the proportion of the total labor force that is unemployed and multiply it by 100. This will give us the unemployment rate for Switzerland. 150,000 unemployed people out of a total labor force of 5 million gives Switzerland an unemployment rate of 3%. This tells us that of every 100 members of the Swiss labor force, only three are actively seeking and unable to find work. This is a very low unemployment rate. It implies that Switzerland is producing very close to its production possibilities curve. So if we look back at our PPC model, we can actually show the level of unemployment in the economy by showing where a country is currently producing with regards to its production possibilities. So if we looked at point A, for example, for 2009, point A implies that the country is achieving its full employment level of output, meaning that at point A, which is on the PPC, almost 0% unemployment exists. Now, 0% unemployment is highly, highly unlikely in a nation's economy. Therefore, when a nation is producing at its full employment level of output, at which unemployment is very, very low, we can assume that it is very close to its production possibilities curve. So I'm going to put a point right here and call this point C. Since Switzerland has 3% unemployment, slightly greater than 0%, this represents a point at which Switzerland is most likely producing when it has 3% unemployment. Notice that it is not exactly on its production possibilities curve, but it is just within the production possibilities curve. The final macroeconomic objective that we're going to discuss today is low inflation. The inflation rate is a way of measuring the change in the price level over time. So let's define inflation and then we'll show how inflation can be calculated. Inflation refers to an increase in the average price level over time. Now, when we say average price level, we're not talking about the prices of particular goods. Inflation does not measure the change in oil prices over time. It does not measure the change in computer prices or automobile prices over time. Rather, what inflation measures is a change in the average price 
level. So governments must have some way of determining what the average price level is. And the tool that governments use to determine the average price level in a nation is an index. The most common index used to measure inflation is what is called the consumer price index, abbreviated CPI. This is simply a basket of consumer goods whose prices can be measured over time. So an example of a consumer price index might be five or six thousand different goods ranging from rent on apartments in urban areas to the cost of cellular phone plans to the price of bread to the cost of milk to the price of flat screen televisions. The different goods that make up a nation's CPI depend on what the typical consumer in a particular nation consumes in a given year. A government can measure the CPI between one period of time and another period of time and by calculating the percentage change in the nation's CPI between two periods of time we can get what is called the inflation rate. So we'll now define the inflation rate. The inflation rate is simply the percentage change in the consumer price index between one period of time and an earlier period of time. So just like our GDP growth rate the inflation rate can be calculated by determining the percentage change in the CPI. So we'll take the CPI 2, this might be in 2010 for Switzerland, we can subtract the CPI from a previous year, let's say 2001, and divide it by the original CPI from the base year, which in this case would be 2009, not 2001. And this will give us the inflation rate. Let's do an example here. Let's assume that in Switzerland, in 2010, the CPI was 156. But in the previous year, 2009, the CPI was 150. Knowing the consumer price indexes for these two years, we can calculate the rate of inflation between 2009 and 2010. All we must do is divide the change in the CPI by the original CPI and multiply this figure by 100 to give us the inflation rate in Switzerland between 2009 and 2010. 156 minus 150 is 6 and if we divide 6 by 150 we get 0 0.04 which multiplied by 100 gives us an inflation rate of 4 percent. An inflation rate of 4 percent is considered fairly low although it is slightly on the high side for a country like Switzerland which would more likely prefer to have an inflation rate of between 2 and 3 percent. Now, going back to our production possibilities curve, how can we illustrate the inflation rate in an economy? This one's not quite as easy as unemployment and economic growth. But one assumption we can make is that if a country is producing at a particular time somewhere within its production possibilities curve, let's say at point, at point D here, one assumption we should make is that when a country is not producing anywhere near its production possibilities, there will be very low inflation. This is because when a country is within its production possibilities curve there are lots of resources that are not being used. Lots of labor is unemployed, lots of capital is not being used, land is abundant and cheap. When a country is producing at point D we can assume that firms can easily acquire more land, labor, and capital at very low cost. Therefore they can adjust their level of output without having to raise their prices. However, if an economy moves from point D to a point closer to its production possibilities curve, let's call this point E, one assumption we can make is that in this increase of output towards the full employment level, inflation is likely to rise. So we can assume that inflation would increase as an economy approaches its production possibilities curve. The reason behind this is that as a country achieves a level of output closer to what it is capable of, resources will become more and more scarce, workers will demand higher and higher wages, land will become more and more expensive to use, and capital will become more and more expensive to acquire. Resources become scarce causing costs of production to rise for firms and therefore prices rise for consumers. So this video lesson has gone through three macroeconomic objectives, economic growth, unemployment, and inflation. A country will desire to achieve economic growth while keeping unemployment and inflation low. The three formulas used to determine 
whether countries achieving these macroeconomic objectives have been explained. GDP growth rate is simply the percentage change in a nation's GDP between one period of time and another period of time. Unemployment rate is simply the number of unemployed people in a nation divided by the total labor force times 100, which gives us an, a percentage of the total labor force that is unemployed. Finally, inflation can be measured using the inflation rate, which uses a price index between two periods of time over which we can calculate the percentage change in the average price level of goods and services produced by a nation. The production possibilities curve is a simple economic model that can be used to show all three of these economic objectives. Economic growth is shown as an outward shift in the PPC. Low unemployment is shown when a nation is producing very close to its PPC. And inflation is shown as a nation's output shifts from a point within the PPC to a point closer to the PPC.